ask later if there's a recording. Alrighty, so let's let's continue. To start with, this work, and I've done this. I think you've seen my my a short bio that I've been involved in the world of energy medicine and the psychological and spiritual causes of disease for the past 30 years. My doctoral dissertation, although it's in psychology, the dissertation itself was on the psychological and spiritual causes of physical disease and disorders. And it was funded by NIH. They funded me to research the work I had created, a method of energy medicine I had created. And um, they asked me to work with fibromyalgia, which was the disease du jour, because disease is very cyclical. And that was the disease at the time. Um, and really looking at how our belief systems impact our stress levels, which impact our physical health. And so what we know is that um, now with the field of psychoneuroimmunology and then evolving into the field of epigenetics, what we know is that our belief systems generate our stress and our stress, and especially in the United States and Western cultures, our stress is so acute that is impacting us and we're at a point of living in that fight or flight mentality because everything is a crisis. There's especially now, and this was pre-pandemic, but certainly during the pandemic, where everything seemed to be about survival. If I don't do this, I'll lose my job. If I don't do this, I could lose my marriage. If I don't do this, my kids will turn against me. Belief systems we've created that generate immense stress. When we live at that level of stress, we are really truly living in the fight or flight mentality. It's like we're fighting to keep our lives the way we believe our lives are meant to be. That impacts the adrenals enormously. And when the adrenals are weakened, that ends up impacting our immune system. And for every one of us, depending on our personality, our immune system has um, predispositions, if you will, in everybody's body. Some people, if you notice, when they get highly stressed, they get migraines. Other people, when they get highly stressed, they get diarrhea. Some get diverticulitis. Some get Crohn's disease, acts up. Others, in high periods of high stress, they get strep throat. Different personalities hold their stress in different places. Some place, some people, it's the upper shoulders. Some, it's the lower back goes out. Everybody handles stress differently. Depending, truly, it all depends on belief systems. So, what we're going to look at is that. We simultaneously live on three levels of existence. The most superficial level is our personality. And unfortunately, many people identify with their personality and we are not our personality. If I could say something that, the way I see it and work with my, my clients on this is that we are sitting in this chair or wherever you are seated at the moment. And on the far side of the room is the life you created. It's all the, the lovers you have had, all the careers you have had, all the homes you have lived in, all the friends you have made, the organizations you have belonged to. All of that is on the far side of the room. And over here is this embodied soul or this embodied essence. And when we begin to see that there is this embodied soul and body essence sitting here. Our life is over there. What ends up happening for most is that they get so lost in their lives that they disappear. So that people present, they don't know what they need. They don't know what they want. They don't know what they like. They are just doing their life. And they somehow got lost in the picture. And when that happens, physical disease starts to develop. For some, they can do that for a short period of time. For some others, they can do it for a little longer, but nobody can do it indefinitely. So what it comes down to is recognizing that our personality, that thing we have created in order to be loved or in order to be safe, is really defining how we do all of this, how we do the life we created, and whether or not we are comfortable enough even owning that we exist apart from everybody and everything else. And on the personality level, and, it, and 
again, it's the most superficial level of us because right underneath the personality level, and I'll go into that in more detail in a moment, but right under the personality level, that thing that we show to the world, frequently it doesn't reflect a thing about who we are. It can reflect completely about who we think we are supposed to be. And underneath that personality is a persona that we put on. I am the wise one, or I am always relaxed when in fact there's acute anxiety going on underneath that mask, underneath that persona. The persona you put out there of, I know everything, or I've got everything under control, whatever that persona is, it's how you want people to see you. And when you put that out there, unfortunately, it's, sometimes we are that, but frequently we're so filled with acute anxiety inside because we know the persona doesn't fit. I don't have it all together, or I don't understand everything, or I'm not independent. I'm feeling really needy right now, whatever, whatever that persona is that we put out. And um, to sustain that persona, we create a mask. You've seen um, the so-called good girls who smile and you know darn well, that's not an authentic smile. All right, or you see the mask people put on, as I said, of having it all together when everything around them is falling apart. People you ask, how are you doing? And you can see they're close to tears and they'll say, fine, thank you. So you know they're not versus saying to you, I'm a mess, I'm falling apart. I just don't wanna talk about it. I'm trying to hold it together. And then go on in authenticity. They'll say to you, I'm fine. And you know, they're not. Those masks that we wear, if we wear them long enough, we actually can no longer identify with what we're honestly feeling because we are so identified with the masks that we wear. We forget what's going on inside of us and are detached from it so much we don't recognize it. And underneath the masks are the defenses we wear. Some of us, when we get stressed, we become very controlling. Some of us, when we become stressed, we become um, this illusion of victim. Some of us become stressed and we get very, very busy, keeping busy uh, avoids it. Some people use humor as a way of deflecting fear. So we create defenses that allow us to sustain our fear without stopping to go beneath the personality and find out what's really going on. And underneath those defenses are the wounds we all have. You know, that wound where we weren't invited to a party, where we lost a job, where um, somebody dropped us in a relationship. You know, the different wounds we may have. And again, don't want to share that I'm perfectly fine. I don't mind at all. I was tired of that relationship anyway. It doesn't matter. I didn't like that job anyway. In a way of brushing off the wound again, rather than dealing with it. And every one of us has a core wound, a wound we came in with that either says, I don't belong, or I'll never be good enough, or I don't know what I'm doing. Whatever that is, it's, it's a it's a belief that permeates us throughout our, throughout our entire lives unless we identify it and then we can change and it comes different for us, all right? So that is really the whole personality level and it doesn't reflect who we are in our essence. It simply reflects this persona, this personality we put out there to the world so that again, some of us are governed by being safe, some of us are governed by being loved. We all want both, but for each of us, one of those is much more important. But underneath that personality, there is the HARA level, H-A-R-A. -A. And that HARA level is that level of intent. It's a state of being. It's, it's when you have an awareness that there is so much more to you than what you present to the world. There's so much more depth to you than perhaps you've bothered to stop and identify. It's at that level truly that you discover your true leadership. It's at that level that you discover your authenticity. And there are four points on the horror level and that if you watch people with Tai Chi they do the yin yang symbol, people who do any of the martial arts, their yoga even will frequently do the yin yang, the, the mother earth and father sky. They will do the yin, the yang and the, mat, the yin in order to bring balance in. 
And there are literally four points because everything in life is about energy. Everything in life is about energy. Um, there are four points on this higher level. If you recognize when you go on a highway and you see rays coming through the clouds, that's the universal energy field. That's the sun rays, that's whatever rays, however you wanna phrase it, but that's the universal energy field. And that exists until about two or three feet above your head where it starts to individu individuate into the human energy field. And that comes in with the baby, it's that soft spot in the crown of the head. That may harden up or firm up as we age, but that, that's, a, but that's a spot that is still there. That is your individuation point and that stays with you to you passing a home back into spirit. And then down where the rib cage comes together is your soul seat. That's where your authentic power exists. People who have real issues around owning how powerful they are, and I think all of us are infinitely powerful, they tend to develop hiatal hernias. They have a very difficult time honoring that their own soul's longing, their own soul seat, their own infinite power that they possess. And you notice sometimes we see pictures, unfortunately, of war zones where people are just holding this and rocking and people think they're holding their heart. They're not holding their heart. Their soul is longing what they wanted for their life's journey, that the power to create what they came here for has been destroyed. Perhaps their family was destroyed, their town was destroyed, their home was destroyed, whatever it may be. And it's much deeper than a broken heart. It's the whole purpose in being as they see it, that, that power to define who they are in their world has been destroyed at that moment. In truth, it hasn't, but that's their experience at that moment in time. And then down between the pubic bone and the navel is the Tan Tien. It's capital T-A-N, capital T-I-E-N. And what that deals with is that spot in you, that seat of wisdom. When we talk about gut knowing, when you walk into some homes, you don't know anything about who lives there, but it doesn't feel good. There's something that doesn't feel good in this house or something feels wonderful in this home and you know nothing about it, but we have a gut knowing. That is our seed of wisdom. And energetically that resonates enormously with our truth, which is why when we sit down in silence, we tend to come away from all the distractions and come inside and we sink into that seed of knowing and we start getting these thoughts. It's of such pure wisdom because that is our seed of wisdom. But when you're frightened of stopping, when you're frightened of that silence and you keep moving, we instead come from knowledge instead of wisdom. And knowledge is wonderful, but wisdom is the depth of who we are. And then the final point in, on the horror line is, is about two feet underneath the ground, underneath our feet in the ground, so that we're really connected to the earth into the sky and it flows back and forth, the earth to the sky, the sky to the earth, it flows back and forth through us. And when people are like that, that who live at that level, those are the ones that you see in a crisis, they stop. They look, what is going on? What needs to be done? Give me a moment and I will find a way of dealing with this because they've stopped and they're living on the level of intent. And at that level of intentionality, they're always living in response, never in reaction. Reaction comes from the personality level. Response comes from the level of intent. It's a very different way. And you've seen people, I know we, you both have, where you meet people that are just so grounded. You know that they are living at this level where they have the ability to take a deep breath and deal with whatever is presented. Doesn't matter, they can be laughing and having a ball over here. Something happens in a split second, they're here and they can deal with whatever gets presented. Um, and finally, the last level is the core level and that is the essence of our own being. That is the soul, that, that connection to our own divinity, the connection to, to the essence of who we truly are. So we have this personality we present to the world that lives in reaction of trying to be safe, trying to have it together, trying to achieve whatever theoretical success looks like to them. 
And then we have that level of intention. And beneath all of that is the essence of the soul that is sitting in this chair that I spoke about in the beginning, that the essence of the soul, this essence of this being sitting in this chair, absolutely apart from the life he or she has created, there's this. When people live at this level, they are living in ease. Therefore, there is no dis-ease. There is no illness. There is this ability to sit and sit solely in that place of ease. It's a very different way of being. It's what oftentimes you see monks or religious nuns living in. You see um, Yoda, if you watch Star Wars and all of those, just living at this place of what is, is. I know who I am, and this is the awareness I live in and respond to whatever presents. So just looking at that, that level of your soul's essence, your core essence, and then the level of intention. When we can live there, emotional intelligence is a given. When we live there, spiritual freedom is a given. And when we live there, physical health is a reality. So we're going up to the personality level and we can see where disease develops. And personalities, styles, and leadership styles correspond completely. The thought leader is that kind of person and that kind of individual. And every one of us, let me back up a moment, every single one of us is a leader of our own lives. We don't have to be a CEO or a COO. We don't have to be a, a manager. We can be a single person living at home by ourselves or living at home with our cat or our dog. And we are the leaders of our own lives. So always it comes back to leadership is not a position. It is who we are. It's how we walk through the world. It's how we acknowledge what is. I have a friend who likes to be acknowledged. And what ends up happening is that when somebody is a thought leader, they are that kind of person who is the catalyst. They come up with all kinds of ideas, all kinds of thoughts that are absolutely creative. It may be that there's a problem going on and a girlfriend of mine was like this and we had said to her at one point, it was a very, very cold fall and we were dreading what winter was going to bring. Someone said to her, Marilyn, um, do you know anybody who has extra blankets? We need to get some blankets together for these folks, these homeless people, they really need to have some heavy blankets. It's a very cold fall and many are not comfortable going into shelters. Well, if they had asked me, I would have called several of my friends who's got extra blankets they don't need. I would have collected them and taken them to a drop-off spot. Not my girlfriend, Marilyn. What Marilyn did, Marilyn said, well, hey, if we need blankets, let's find a couple manufacturers of blankets. We can call them up, see what they're doing with their seconds. Are they selling them at discount stores? Or we could ask them to donate them. They could do a tax write-off and we could have thousands of blankets to give out to the homeless. Her thoughts, she, this is who she was. She was a thought leader. She came and she did this and made it happen. And I can give you example after example of how Marilyn did this. It's who she was. However, once Marilyn got the truck, got these people to distribute it, got them to bring the truck over, she was out. She had absolutely no desire to have anything to do with implementation. She didn't want to have to deal with the people. She didn't want to be a leader over people. She wanted nothing to do with any of that. The thought leader is who Marilyn was, the catalyst. And then she disappeared. For these po folks, they have amazing strengths in thought leadership. What they tend to do is they are very creative. They are very spiritual. If you know people who tend to be psychic or pretend to have an inner knowing, they are 
uh, they are our artists, they are dancers, all of those, those folks that have a great creativity. This is who they are when they are healthy. When they are not in a healthy place, they have existential fear. Everything could be going right in their life and they're waiting for the shoe to drop. Everything could be going right in their life and they're waiting for a crisis to happen. So there's absolutely no ability to relax. They truly see this world as a dangerous place to be. So they are filled with immense fear, living in a very dangerous world. And now what happens in an organization, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're working for a company, the thought leader is terrific, but you need to have somebody else who knows how to implement, who knows how to make things happen. Like Marilyn could get all the blankets in, but who was going to distribute them? How we were going to set up a place to do it? What we were going to, couldn't go there, did not want to have to work with people. And unfortunately, in some organizations, people that have these great ideas will say, oh, you're perfect, you can take over the project. And then that person goes into panic because that means, oh my God, now I have to create a system. Now I have to deal with all those people. Now I'm responsible for making everything happen. And then the, the fear builds and builds and builds. And then they go into survival which is the adrenals, because they are filled with existential terror. They're convinced they're going to fail, and they end up doing so because they're so filled with fear. It doesn't dawn on them to get a great team around them who can start the implementation of all these great ideas. They don't have to do it all. Of the five leadership styles that I'm going to share with you tonight, we generally, folks, have two of them as a primary. Three are very secondary. You may have... 50% of one, 30% of another, and that other 20% is scattered amongst the other three. And so it's just I've identified which is yours rather than focusing on the people you're in a relationship with. What are yours primary and what's your secondary? And then, then you can notice the others. And none of them are the right one or the wrong one. We've got all of them. It's just some we have in much greater proportions than others. So for these particular leaders, when you put them in front of working with people, they don't succeed at it. And then they're considered a failure or weak, when in truth, they're immensely powerful over here. But with, with their existential fear, they set themselves up to fail. And they also haven't developed the skill sets to do that. So what ends up happening is believing life is, is, is existentially dangerous they start seeing the filter through which they see the world as they see danger everywhere. They see everybody out to get them. And they, because they're so filled with fear and because they're in theory all the time, they're, they're in their minds, they're thinking of all the things that could go wrong. They're not really conscious of what's happening here. So they have a huge propensity to have difficulties in the muscles, bones, ligaments, and tendons. They tend to fall a great deal. They tend to walk into things. These are the folks who, when they take a shower in the evening, are going to find a massive black and blue mark on their leg. And all of a sudden, now that they see it, it is excruciatingly painful when they may have had it since 10 o'clock this morning. But they were so not in their body, as we say. They were not present to their body. They didn't even know they were in pain until they stopped. I've been on the phone with a patient who looked down and said, my God, there's blood all over the floor. I said, look, look at your feet. Oh my God, I'm bleeding from my foot. Hang up the phone. See if you need to go to the emergency room. See what's going on. They didn't even feel it until they saw blood. Because again, they were so distracted, nobody was noticing. All right. The second personality type is the, the team leader. This is that personality that has the ability to recognize in a team, whether it's four people or 40 people, they recognize everybody's strengths, they recognize everybody's limitations. These, and for careers, these folks tend to become social workers or they become folks who, it's always in the service profession, they may become ministers. They're always, they're, they're in service because they love people. They love to work with people. They support them and they take care of them every way they can. And so what this team leader does is they are there. They're very safe people to talk to. 
They are great motivators. They get people going, they get people motivated, they keep it happening. If the company creates a culture, they are the folks that implement the culture within their team. They get things going, living in the, in the company's culture. They make it something that's a unifying factor and they create strong teams. Melissa, you said you've got a team of folks. It's like, what's the culture of your company or what's the culture of your team? Because some larger companies, there may be a corporate culture but if you go to different departments, there's different cultures in every department. You know, so what's the culture that you want to create? And then you can look and see the people that fit best in that culture. And how do you create that solid team with them? And in their finest, what they do is they develop individual leaders all around them. Everybody that works for them, they teach them how to be effective leaders. Think of even, even the man in the cleaning, cleaning equipment he or she may be downstairs and they're assigned to clean these four different departments. But yet as they're going down, they find out that there's a flood in the hallway. The person who hasn't, doesn't own their power, doesn't own their leadership is gonna say, thank God this is in my area. And they keep on going. Somebody who is connected to their own personal leadership. I mean, they may be a cleaning crew, but they connected to their personal leadership. They're going to say, my God, we've got a problem here they're gonna find out where the leak is, they're gonna shut the water off, then they're gonna call folks to help come and wipe all this up. They'll get the team together to wipe all this up and rectify it before they then go and deal with their own departments. But that person that doesn't own their leadership, that team leader who doesn't own it, is simply gonna say, it's not my job. They're not invested in themselves, much less invested in their company. Because when it's who you are, when you walk in that essence, that intention, you recognize not only are you here to make the world a better place, you're here to continuously grow yourself into a separate entity that truly knows who he or she is and can make that happen. And as I said, they understand people, they understand their wants is because a leader, they step up to the plate. It doesn't matter what their position is. It doesn't matter who they are. They step up to the plate because they know what needs to be done. Certainly not in something they can't handle. If I see go by and I see something on fire, I'm not going to put it out, but I am going to call the fire department immediately. Then I'm going to try to help anybody who may be around, but I'm not going to take responsibility for putting that out. I don't have the equipment and I don't really know what to do. So you step in and help the best way you can because a leader always is available and present. And when they are not in that solid, strong place, their vulnerabilities are they don't recognize their own needs. They have no idea what they need or want. They're terrified of being abandoned. And they become those folks that suck you dry. And we all know those folks that we're with them 15 minutes and we're exhausted because they've just sucked us dry. They are so needy. And no matter how much you do for them, they need more, they want more, and there is never enough. They hold on too long in relationships that they know are not working and they should let them go, but they hold on anyway because they're frightened of letting go. These folks are also the hoarders because it's never enough. They hoard. Um, and they expect other people to fill their needs. So they set others up to fail because they don't tell them what they need. They're just angry when their needs are not met, even though they've not told anybody what they need. Now, this is again, when they're not in their leadership, when they're not in their power, and we're all human, we all fluctuate back and forth. The thing is to live in our strengths, to live in our leadership supports us as we walk this journey. And then momentarily on occasion, we, we go into that vulnerable place. But some of us live in the vulnerable place and they're frightened of taking that, that authority, that leadership that's natural, that they're naturally called to. And they end up waiting for somebody else to rescue them and make it all better. The basic beliefs when they are healthy is that we are all in this together. And especially now this year, you've seen many step up to the plate who have said we are all in this together, whether it's because of the Black Lives Matters or it is because of COVID. And they're stepping up and helping out however they can and making things happen. Some you see in some neighborhoods, people are really coming together and encouraging folks to go to their local restaurants and do takeout, order pizza three nights a week, keep the company going, help our local businesses survive in the midst of, co of this COVID. So there's a basic belief we're all in this together. And as a team leader, they work to make that happen. When they're in most vulnerable, they feel absolutely alone, terrified everybody's gonna leave them. 
and they can't get enough. Consequently, on a physical level, they end up, they're passive waiting for everybody else to recognize their needs when they're unhealthy. And because of that, that passivity, they have very low immune function. They usually end up with reproductive issues, diabetes. If you have diabetes, this is a good indicator that this personality construct is up for you right now. Obesity, all right, again, because they can't get enough. They feel very needy. They haven't identified what they need and they haven't given themselves permission to fill those needs. So obesity becomes an issue. Diabetes is an issue, all right? So then the reproductive, lower back pain, addictions are very common, whether it's drug addiction, alcohol addiction, food addiction, um, hoarding, all of those become obesity and eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia, a part of this, this personality um, because it's all around needs and they don't deal with need because it frightens them. So when you look at that, um, they go from that team leadership when they're really healthy and in relationship in a healthy way, people confide in them because they're safe to be around, all right? People feel safe around them because there's something warm and loving about them because they really are a team player. The next part, in all of these, the first one develops in utero or at birth. This one here develops at the bottle feeding stage when a child's basic needs are being met or perhaps their needs for emotional or spiritual support are not provided. The third type of leadership and personality style is a supportive leader. Now, this is that person who is frequently judged perhaps as not being a leader, but being a follower. This is the one that does not want to be the CEO or the COO. What they want to do with their life is they want to be that person who is the VP who has the CEO's back. If you're a keynote speaker, that's the person that has set up the stage for you. That's the person that's made sure the mic works for you. They're the one that supports you every step of the way. They may have 14 people working for them, they like the role of being in charge. They like that leadership capability, but they don't have any desire to be center stage. This is not a lack of drive. It's not a lack of motivation. They just love being the one that supports. Some people would love to be on stage and are terrified. That's a completely different personality. I'm talking about the one that has no desire to be there. They absolutely love being the support staff for the person on there. Um, their strengths are they are very loyal, very persevering. You've got a project that's due tomorrow. They'll be up till three or four in the morning with you tonight to make sure it gets done. They have your back. They are persevering. They are very hard workers, extremely capable of great love. They, are, they love unconditionally and they can be very playful with a great sense of humor. This is when they are healthy. This is who they are. When they are not in a great emotionally healthy place, they become very passive aggressive. They don't want to be angry because their greatest need is to be loved. So they don't allow themselves to become very angry outwardly because they're frightened people will abandon them, people will leave them if they get angry. So they become very passive aggressive in their anger. They have um, a tendency to go to martyrdom and to play victim. You know, in the belief they possess when they're in their wounded state is that um, the more I suffer for you, the more you will like me or the more you will love me. So I'm not going to just do something for you and hide it. I'm going to say, I just want you to know I did this, this, and this for you today. I just want you to know I did that, that, and that. I want you to know that I ran and I was exhausted. I didn't feel good, but I don't care. I know you needed it, so I went and do it. So the more they build it up, the more martyrdom they project, the more they assume you will be grateful for them, therefore, the more you will love them. And so when they are vulnerable, that's the place they play. Um, they also tend to be extremely overwhelmed. So as a leader, when they're in their leadership position, again, whether you're working at home by yourself and you create 18 tasks to get done today, even though three of them are gonna take eight to 10 hours each, you create this huge list for yourself you get overwhelmed and you're even less functional. You're even less capable of doing it. What ends up happening for them is that they sink into depression around how powerless they are and around how difficult life is. They live their life in survival. 
They live their life in getting by. They don't have permission to be absolutely free and powerful and alive because it goes against the martyrdom. It goes against their purpose in wanting to be loved and believing the only way to do so is to be a victim and a martyr. When they are healthy, their basic beliefs are that they are good. People are good. They love people. All right. Um, they really will do anything for anybody. They are the first one to stand up. The first one that says, hey, I can take that on. Let me help out. I'm willing to be here for you. So that there's really an innate goodness about these people, an innate loving wonderfulness about these people. Um, it's only when they are in their own insecurities that they feel they're not important, they're not valued. And I would if I could, but I can't, becomes a way of life. As again, I said, struggle becomes it. In relationships, they are very unconditionally loving and giving when they are in a great place. They have a great ability to forgive, deal with the problem. They will forgive it and move on because they're about loving and being in relationship. When they're not in a healthy place, when they're in a wounded place, they do a great deal of blame, a great deal of anger at being victimized and being used. They just keep going and giving and giving until they're so exhausted they become ill. And then they blame all the people who took. And yet everybody they bring into their life is a taker. Because these people need to be needed. So they surround their life with people who need them. And then they become depleted and then they blame everybody in their life when in fact, they never learn to say no. And when you don't learn to say no and you keep giving, you're so overextended, you do a poor job at everything. So you need to learn to say no so that the few things you do take on, you can do extremely well. When you try to do everything and be everything for everybody, you will fail. They will be mad at you because you overpromised. Then you will feel like a victim because they judge you when you do so much for everybody. Now they're judging you for failing. And they have the right, if you committed, to expect that you will follow through. The fact that you can't follow through because you committed to 14 things today isn't their responsibility. It's yours because you didn't learn to say no after the second and third thing. So it really becomes this Again, they're victimized and they're judged and they go back into powerless and overwhelmed. All right, so it's looking at what happens here. When they are out of balance, remember again, with every one of them, they can be perfectly balanced. When they're out of balance, they tend to develop breast cancer. Breast cancer is about giving. The left side of the body is the yin, the feminine side. Left breast cancer is about, I believe I have the right to identify and fill my own needs, but only after everybody else's needs are met. And they've trained everybody to expect everything of them. So therefore they will never have a point where everybody else's needs are met. Right breast cancer is the yang, it's the masculine, it's all about belief systems. In the Judeo Christian culture, they don't believe they have a right to meet their needs because that's selfish. There's always somebody else who needs more and then breast cancer develops. When I was working as a healer at Hartford Hospital here in Connecticut, I um, had a woman come in and see me. She had two sets of twins under five years of age, and she had um, bilateral breast cancer, and it had spread, and she had said, I'm not going home. I'm going to die here in this hospital bed, and I said, the doctors say they got it all. She said, I don't care. I'm not going home. I never wanted those kids. He wanted the kids. Then he gets a job as a traveling salesman and I'm home raising all these kids. I'm not going home. I'm gonna die in this bed. And she did. She didn't commit suicide. She just gave up and passed in that bed because she didn't want to do it. She couldn't learn to say, no, I don't want these kids. Even after the first set of twins, I'm done. I've got my tubes tied or I had whatever, whatever and left it, but instead continued having the children resentful and angry, and then chose to leave. Again, not suicide. It's just we can do that. We can will ourselves to death. And they also, they deal with exhaustion. They deal with dehydration because they don't take time to drink. They don't take time to fill their own needs, even fluids. So dehydration is a problem. Chronic fatigue is this personality. Liver problems, this personality. Liver is about depression and resentment and anger. 
and that type of anger comes from the illusions of victimization. So these folks develop liver problems, chronic fatigue, breast cancer, digestive disorders. And many of these digestive disorders are because they're eating on the go. They're feeding the family, they're feeding the kids and they're eating while they're in the kitchen. By the time they sit down, they're pretty much full. They, they ate or they shove it in because they've got to get up and start cleaning the kitchen after. So they really don't recognize their own need to stop, feel their needs and take care of themselves. All right. And so, as I said, in leadership, when they're healthy, they want to support. When they're not healthy, they want to support everybody. They take on way more than they should and don't know how to say no for fear that they will not be liked. Therefore, they don't do anything well. It's all okay, but it doesn't excel because they are too busy. They put far more demand on themselves than they will ever have the ability to do. And you can see people now, I know many people that I've met or that I know, friends who are retired, who are exhausted because they're now volunteering at so many places. And then friends ask them to play golf, friends ask them to play shuffleboard, friends ask them to play cards, friend, and then three volunteer organizations call them because they're retired. Now they're exhausted. They want to go back to work because this is exhausting them. If they knew how to say no, I'll work for this one charity, I will play one sport, or I'll play two sports, but one this week and one next week, because I want a quieter lifestyle. Others may turn against them, life will go on, but they will have them in the picture, they will have themselves, which they don't have when they don't know how to say no. All right. The next leadership style is the visionary leader. Very different from the thought leader. The visionary leader is that personality that makes things happen. The thought leader comes up with the vision. The thought leader has these great ideas. The visionary leader knows how to take that vision and implement it. They are the folks that make things happen. They are the CEO, a good CEO. Unfortunately, we all know leaders who are in positions, thought leaders who are put in there as a CEO to make things happen. It fails. They wanted to go up the ladder and they didn't know how to go up as a thought leader. So they went up a chain that had nothing to do with their natural skills. So they've had heart attacks, they've had strokes, they've had all kinds of diseases going up the ladder because they betrayed themselves every step of the way. I believe the moment we become ill it's our soul's way of saying, stop. What's going on? How are you betraying yourself? What do you need to do differently? It is, I say that again, illness, whether it is a cold or a cancer, it doesn't matter what it is. Illness is a message from our soul, from our essence to stop a broken leg, stop. I believe spirit gives us a soft touch on the cheek and it may say, I just tripped over something and says, oh, you better slow down. But I'm too busy to slow down. I've got too much to do. So now I'm gonna keep going. Now I'm gonna trip. Ooh, that, that hurt and grabbed something and fell, I'm okay. Before you know it, I'm spread out on the ground and I've got a broken leg. So why does this happen to me? Well, you knew back there. It was time to slow down, but you didn't listen. I get this, people with migraines. I had a headache, but there was so much to do. I committed to stopping after I did this one more project. And then all of a sudden, I was so I was getting nauseous. I was so sick, but I took some aspirin just to help finish up the program. And now I got a migraine. Why do I get the migraines? Nobody else seems to get them. Well, you didn't need the migraine. Your body told you way back there it was time to stop, and you didn't listen. And so... For me, working with folks in healthcare, it isn't just providing medical services, it's educating them on what disease is about, why it takes place, why they keep pushing their stress levels to such an extent that the disease takes place. This style here and the personality, they are very powerful, recognized leaders. There's a presence about them that they walk in a room, you don't know who they are, but you know they're somebody. Because they walk in a room with the presence, they walk in a room with an energetic footprint that is large, that says, I am somebody. 
Not for a moment does it mean I am somebody more important than anybody else. It just says that when they are healthy, they recognize they are somebody. So I used to say to my children, you are exquisitely unique, but nobody will ever be special, but you are exquisitely unique. Appreciate the beauty of your uniqueness. These leaders, when they are healthy, know that, that this is my skill, this is what I'm good at. I've made it to CEO, I did it. Now I have the ability to exercise my vision and bring it. All these thought leaders around me, I put it together. It's in alignment with my vision of why I'm here, my purpose on earth. And now I can make it happen. And this is exciting for me. So they become the visionary leaders. They are powerful, recognized leaders, very charismatic. They are powerful speakers, great keynote speakers, great trainers. They get people, because they're charismatic, they get people invested in what they're saying. People are sitting on the edges of their seats. They can't wait to learn more and hear more because these folks have a presence that says, I know what I'm talking about. And if I didn't, I would never humiliate myself by putting myself on the center stage and not know what I'm talking about because they know who they are. They know their strengths, they know their limitations and they are amazingly cool under fire. When they are not in confidence, when they are not in balance, for whatever reason, and they're in their vulnerable, wounded space, they become very intimidating or very seductive or very manipulative, immensely controlling. Their belief is either you control others or you get controlled. And since nobody will ever control me, I will always be in control of everybody else. Now, this again is when they are in fear, not when they're in balance. And so they will find whatever they need to do to be in control of the room. That's where the manipulation, the seduction or the intimidation comes in. But they are terrified of not having full control for fear that they will be controlled. They come from a family where there was a lot of abuse. And there was one person in that house who was in control and they will never let anybody control them again. So they stay there in when they're out of balance. Their basic beliefs when they're healthy is I can achieve anything I set out to do. And they can, because as I said, they make things happen. They have a clear point of view. They know what they need to do. And if they don't, they will find out. They have no problem asking for help to get to where it is they wanna go. And you can trust they will get there, all right? When they are vulnerable, however, I must never show anybody I don't know. I must never show anybody any weakness because I believe they will use it against me. And they will say things such as you are with me or you are against me. All right. And it is my way or the highway. We don't debate. We don't discuss. This is how it goes. That's what happens when they are in fear. When they're not in fear, and let's say there's a board meeting or there's a meeting at your house and somebody wants you to do something, you are quite comfortable sitting back saying, is this, is this a good thing for me to do? No, it's not. I have a meeting tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. I've got to get to bed early. I can't take this on to do tonight. And they will say that they are leading their own lives. They understand what they need, they understand what they want, and they understand what is expected. And they know that if they took this on, they'd be up until midnight, and they would not be good at the meeting tomorrow morning. So therefore, they're not going to take it on. And they can do that without guilt. They can do that without self-blame. And others can try to put blame or guilt or whatever on them, but they don't take it on because they recognize, I need to do this. This isn't selfish. This is self-care. All right. In relationships, they are very lovingly protective and supportive when they are healthy. All right. They are there and they will support anybody and they will do that. There's a protectiveness about them, a loving warmth and protectiveness about them that others can rely on and trust that they will be there for them. All right. When they are again out, they are very controlling in relationship. Their diseases they are more prone to is heart attacks. If you can think of the thought that I'm gonna hop and pop and blow your house down, that's this personality. And women, they tend to be very big busted. Men have these very broad shoulders and thin thin bellies and, and, and thin legs. 
but so all of their energy is held up in the top part of their body. So heart attacks are common. What we know in the industry that heart attacks come about because of a shock in relationship. Heart disease develops because this is all energetics. Heart disease develops because there have been patterns of issues in relationships for a lifetime and heart disease slowly develops. They are holding on, it ends up physically, they're holding on to plaque in their bodies and, and really filling the arteries, filling the veins, filling everything in the system in a way that can't process. But when they are healthy, it all gets cleaned out and it flows. We've got people so close to heart attacks, they back off and they get their health going. Others appear to be absolutely healthy, they're running every day, they don't smoke, they eat well, they do everything, but their relationships are not going well at all and they have a heart attack. So I don't know how they did that because they were in such great shape. They were in appearance, but what was going on inside is a relationship issue. They tend to have very high blood pressure because what happens to them is they put all of these expectations on themselves to control and be in charge of. And this is the illusionary leader, the illusionary CEO and in my experience with CEOs and out of the size of the organization is they feel like an imposter because they have a belief that a CEO knows how to do everything, knows how to handle everything, never has a problem, always has clear vision and always can go forward. Nobody does. Welcome to humanity. And so they have this huge blood pressure issue because of all the pressure they put on themselves to know how to do everything and to be in control of all situations. None of us are. We all have things that show up out of nowhere. The skill is to step back and to intend. Didn't see that one coming. How am I going to deal with it? Staying in intent, staying in the strengths of the visionary leader who is charismatic, recognized, generous, cool under fire, they deal with it, give them a moment if or day, depending on how big the situation is, and they will come out with an approach to handling it when they are in alignment with who they are. When they're not, that's the high blood pressure. Um, they can have muscle spasms and that people develop benign essential tremors where their hands are going and going and going because they need absolute control. And their, their lack of control becomes so large they can't even control their limbs that their arms just shake amazingly. Gallbladder disorders, these folks tend to have strokes. Again, they hold all their energy up here so they can have strokes, but heart attack is their major issue for them, all right? And lastly, the, it is the organizational leader. And these organizational leaders, um, they are very high achievers, but they are very organized. They are very self-confident, very responsible absolutely very responsible. They can be very passionate and adventurous. They just, going on adventures is extremely exciting for them. All of that takes place when they are in the essence of who they truly are at the soul level. This is the qualities they project. Very highly high achiever, very organized, self-confident, responsible, and passionate and very, very adventurous. People love to be around them because you they're not intimidating. They're very powerful, but they're not at all intimidating. The jobs they tend to have, if they had their way, they would be in a back room all by themselves, writing procedures and protocols. The thought leader may have great ideas. The visionary leader know what they want to implement. The team leader's got things going. The support staff is ready to roll. They love it leave me out of it, I'll be back here writing procedures and protocols, setting up the schedules, I'm the accountant, I'm the architect, I'm that kind of thing that doesn't need to be around people. I just want to make things work in the back room. Unfortunately, when they are so good at that, people say, you are so good at organizing and keeping things running, keeping it going, I'm gonna give you a team of 40, you know, help work with them and help make it all happen. They don't want to. They're not a people person in that way. Their control, the, the visionary leader wants to control the whole world around them so that they feel safe. The organizational leader simply wants their space perfect. They could care less what's going on in your space. They could care less what's happening with the team. They want their place to be organized. They are going to create a system. They'll create procedures. They'll create protocols. This is where they feel safe in order. 
And when you are put over large groups of people, there is never organization in order. When you're placed over lots of people, what ends up happening is you're going to have every one of these personalities. Some of them are going to be in the healthy state. Some are going to be in the vulnerable state. Their humanity is going to be popping up. And this crowd doesn't know how to handle that because they need order. So when you bring chaos to their room, they feel absolutely out of control. They feel absolutely vulnerable. And then they struggle and struggle to be a perfectionist. They, the perfectionism is their greatest vulnerability. They get easily angered because their stress is so high. The moment something is out of order, the moment there is stress, they take it to the next level because it's all supposed to be working perfectly. So their vulnerability is that perfectionism that makes them so easily angered when anything isn't going the way it was supposed to. But I wanted it to go that way. I planned it on going that way. Who messed it up? What happened? And they get filled with angst around that, okay? Other than that level of stress, they have great difficulty in expressing emotions. Only that anger about things falling apart, but they don't express their emotions well because they don't want to associate with anything that isn't in order. And emotions Emotions are not in order. Emotions are all over the place, whether it's emotions of joy, emotions of sadness. They don't know how to handle it when somebody is extremely sad. They don't know how to handle it when somebody is extremely needy. They don't know how to handle it when somebody is overjoyed. It's too much chaos. It's too much noise and they need to go away. All right. So what ends up happening for them is that they can develop really deep connections and deep conversations, because remember, they're high achievers, they're passionate about many things. They can develop great conversations and be a fun person to be with. But in terms of intimacy, in terms of vulnerability and sharing their vulnerability, sharing their intimacy with you so that you truly know them inside and out, it's not their strength. Because they're frightened of you to see them less than perfect because if they are less than perfect, then you won't love them. And they are raised by parents to believe that in order to be loved, you need to be perfect. When you keep a perfectly clean room, we will love you and you can come out here and be with the family. Until that room is perfectly clean, you can't be among anybody. So they know that in order to be connected and order to be involved, they have to be perfect. And it really makes their life very difficult. They long for tenderness, yet they're very uncomfortable with affection. They're afraid of being hurt because they're not good enough. They're not perfect. So they're pushed, pulled. Common diseases for them, again, is heart disease versus heart attack, very different, is heart disease because they don't have that ability for intimacy that's missing in their relationships. And they want it, but they don't know how to be intimate and they're terrified of it. Lung disease is a real issue for this personality style. This, this leadership style, because lungs are about your ability to breathe in life and all of its changes. And life is always changing. We never know how it's going to change, but you can govern it's going to change. And with these folks, remember, they like everything in order. So life's changes are frightening. And so they, they hold on. The thymus, asthma is a huge problem for these folks. Anybody with asthma? Um, circulation issues are a real issue for them because they hold themselves so tight. They struggle to be perfect. Nothing is ever out of alignment, yet they think they're a mess. But if you look at them, their hair is perfect, their clothes are perfect, they dress perfectly, and yet they feel like a mess because somewhere in one of their socks, there was a thread that was pulled when they were putting it on. And that upset their entire day. And I'm not exaggerating, all right? So they hold themselves so tight that literally circulation, constipation is a big problem. Circulation is a problem. Emotionally, they become the obsessive compulsives. All right. I hope you can see, I know we went a few minutes over, but I hope you can see that um, each of these personalities, we all have pieces, but you have one or two that are primarily yours. And when you look at it and you're imbalanced, everything is great. It's when we step out of balance because of our fears, because of our defenses, because of our wounds, whatever it may be, that we set ourselves up for the particular diseases and disorders that are common to our particular personality. I've done a lot of talking. Are there any questions I can answer for either of you? Sure. No. Yeah. Just real quick. Um, there was four, the five that you mentioned, two yeah. of them were more 
primary and then the others are more secondary, but we all have all five. We all have all five, but in my experience, Patty, most of the time there can be anywhere from 40 to 80% mm -hmm. is yours. And maybe the secondary has 10%. And the other three share that last 10%, you know, but frequently it's more like, you know, 40, 30 or 45, 35. And then the other three just have spatterings, you know, but we have all of them. We have all of them within us. We just have our predominant personality, which is why you can have two team leaders, but one secondary is organization. So they're a team leader, but they're also very rigid. Another team leader but the secondary is support. So they're gonna feel very different, even though they're both team leaders, they're gonna feel very different because the secondary is so different. Wow. Okay. Yep. Melissa, do you have a question? No, I'm just still so in. I really appreciate it. Good, I hope, I hope this helped inform you some, about some of the people you're working with um, on your team, but also, um, all, the, all the, the claims you're filing. And so to me, the gift of doing this work is to teach people how to understand their own illnesses, to teach people to understand that they don't have to be sick if they can learn how to deal with what's going on, if they can learn how to recognize, because we get messages, we always get messages. You know, when, when somebody has a heart attack and later, you say, um, did you find you had a great deal of stress about a situation in your life? Well, now that I think about it, yeah, but I was so busy, I didn't notice it before. Well, when we can learn to calm down, you will notice it before and you don't end up with, because most folks when they are ill, if you stop and ask, they'll tell you. And if it's a broken leg and they have to sit still for a period of time, they'll say, I know I need it to slow down. This is one way of making me do it. You know, so we know beforehand if we choose to see things, but we don't always choose to see things and disease ends up developing. And type two diabetes in any of these chronic diseases, we know now in healthcare, and I'm sure you know better than I, the latest of if there's any releases out this month, but over you know 80% of expenses is on chronic disease. And chronic disease is the result of our lifestyle. You know, type one diabetes is dramatically different than type two diabetes, you know? Um, but our lifestyle, whether it's high blood pressure, whether it's um, cholesterol, whether, and, and some families have a propensity, but if it's just genetics, if both parents are diabetic, all five children should be diabetic. And yet if you do research, you find out both parents are diabetic and two or three of their kids are diabetic and the others aren't. And if you look at the kids who are diabetic like their parents, the home is decorated the way the parents did. They have the same belief systems politically, spiritually, and whatever globally as their parents did. If you, the same lifestyle as the parents, if you look at the kids who don't have diabetes, they live a dramatic different lifestyle than their family did. And energetically, they are in a very different place energetically. And we know that. We know when we're balanced energetically, it's like everything is flowing. And we also know energetically some days we, we don't have the energy to move. And to me, those are the days when we stop and say, what's going on? It has nothing to do with the outside world has everything to do with how am I perceiving what's going on in the outside world? What's going on with me? And how can I deal with me so I can get back into this place? So as we identify what's, you know, identify things that are wrong with me, and let's say you do type two diabetes and you're able to reverse it. It means that you're clearly seeing your addiction issue and what that's all about and, and yeah. you're Trying to get better. Okay. Yeah. Patty, um, I have yet, and I mean this literally, um, seen a person who could not reverse their type two diabetes when they chose to do so. Yep. I've seen many being told by their physicians that you'll be on insulin the rest of your life. I mean, so it's basically, so don't even try. Yep. Um, but, but try to lose some weight if you can. But others who have said, you know, lose weight, start exercising, 
look at what's going on in your life. It really is because diabetes is about a lack of sweetness in your life. Where can you get sweetness in your life other than through food? Where can it come in? And for some it's, it's animals, for some it's walking, for some it's exercise. We, cause we need exercise, every one of us because it keeps the energy going. It keeps the energy circulating, not just the blood. It keeps the energy circulating. So exercise, I mean, for some people it's, it means bodybuilders but for the majority of us, it means, can I walk a half an hour on my treadmill every day? Can I walk a mile every day around my neighborhood? What, what does that mean? It doesn't matter what it is but when I can get my body to that point where I can walk a mile every day or when I can realize that I don't need those four cookies for dessert or for a snack, you know, that all of a sudden I realize when I don't exercise, I feel this way. When I have those four cookies, I feel this way. When I don't, all of a sudden I got, everything feels fluid. It feels like it's moving. I feel better. And for some people that is terrifying. Yeah. I don't want to feel what I feel because it scares the daylights out of me let me stop exercising, let me keep eating more. And then the diabetes gets worse, all right? So, and then others reverse it. And this is no blame here. There's no blame, there's no judgment on any of these. We're all human, we have all had medical conditions um, and we all have to go home, but we don't all have to go home through serious disease. Some people are perfectly healthy, they go to bed and they don't wake up. You know, some, some go through hell for the last five years of their life. You know, so it's, it's, what are we doing? Where do we want to go? How do we want to do this? And it comes back to that personal leadership of my life, the best way I know how. And if it means I've been exposed, such as in this call, to the world of epigenetics, our belief systems impacting our health then it means I want to study more about that. I want to study more about integrative healthcare. I want to study more about how this works because now I know there are answers and you can't pretend after this call that you haven't heard it. You can pretend it's all crazy, but you can't pretend you haven't heard it. So that when you see somebody with an illness, it doesn't cross your mind. Oh, I wonder what's going on in their life. Because always that's my first thought as I wonder what's going on in their life. But because I've been doing this work for 30 years, I can generally tell you what's going on in their life when I find out what their medical history is. You know? So I hope this has helped both of you. And um, I'm here. Drop me an email. Drop me a text if you have any questions. I'm more than willing to, to answer any for you if they pop up. All righty? Thank okay. you. Will we be able to get an email with the recording? Um, yes, you will. The recording will be available um, probably in about an hour, half an hour to an hour. And I will have my VA send it out to you tomorrow morning. Great. Right. Thank you so much. Oh, you are so welcome. All righty. Bye-bye.